Welcome to our final seminar in our series as part of the Irish Modernisms Exhibition at the Centre for Contemporary Art, Derry, London, Derry. I'm Catherine Hemmelwright, CCA's Director, co-curator of the project with Matt Retallick, and today our focus is Eritrea with speakers Dawit L. Petros and Edward Dennison. We're using Otter AI for live transcription, so click the link and follow the instructions at the top left if you'd like to use captioning and drop questions. Laura, a line if you have any tech questions. Irish Modernisms is an exhibition at CCA presenting five NI artists influenced by and referencing the legacies of modernism in the North. James Ash, Rachel Campbell Palmer, Ben Weir, Philip McCrilly and Grace McMurray, who is part of the Turner Prize nominated collective array. And you can see the exhibition until the extended run of the 25th of September 2021. The exhibition focuses on the north of Ireland, but modernism has a presence stretching worldwide. Our Global Context Seminar today examines East Africa and Eritrea with its complex history and various parallels with our context of Derry, London Derry. Eritrea too was an outpost for colonial power. Following the partition of Africa in the 1880s to 1930s, Italian rule undertook extensive programs of construction. The capital city of Asmara is now lauded as an exceptional example of early modernist urbanism in the African context. And in July 2017, the entire city was listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site for its thousands of Art Deco, futurist, modernist and rationalist buildings. Our speakers today will explore the relationships between modernism, Africa, Europe and history. Edward Dennison will speak about the city's UNESCO nomination and how the city's renowned modernist architecture owes a debt not to Europe but to Africa. And Dawit L. Petros will discuss his current research project, Spazio Disp Disponibile, Italian for available space. The project traces the interconnected material histories of Eritrea, Italy, and Canada, and examines how built forms visualized cultural ideologies, shaped social action, and subjects whose effects continue to have a meaning and impact in the present. Edward is a professor of architecture and global modernities at the Bartlett School of Architecture, UCL, where he's director of the MA Architecture and Historic Info Urban Environments. His research focuses on decentering the historiography of modern architecture. And in 2016 and 17, he won the Reba President's Medal for research for his work on Asmara, Eritrea, and former Manchukuo in China. Dawit is a visual artist, researcher, and educator. His work is informed by studies of global modernisms through theories of diaspora and post colonial studies. Dawit is a co-founder of the Black Athena Collective with artist Heber Y. Amin, and he is an assistant professor in the Department of Photography at the School of Art Institute of Chicago. You can read more about our speakers in the guide for today's seminar, available to download from our website, ccadld.org, and I will put a link in the chat. Each speaker will present for about 20 minutes, We'll be having a screen break of around 10 minutes, and then we'll be joined by Dr. Catherine Milligan to facilitate our discussion with yourselves and our speakers until 2.30. If any burning questions arise during the presentations, you can put them into the chat to questions for Laura. And finally, thank you to our supporters, Arts Council of Northern Ireland, Derry City and Strabane District Council, and these seminars are made possible thanks to the British Art Network, the Paul Mellon Centre, Yale, Arts Council England and Tate. And thanks to Jessica Dukes, Martin Myrone, Daniel Goulet, and a big thank you all for joining us. So without further ado, I'm delighted to welcome our first speaker, Edward Dennison. Catherine, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to all the team for uh, inviting me to participate. I hope that you can see the screen okay. Um, that's all good. Um, I, I will follow the strict instructions to the timing of 20 minutes. And um, as Catherine has said, my, my presentation today will be focusing on the experience that Asmara um, has had with regards to its application for UNESCO World Heritage listing for its modernist heritage. Um, as she also mentioned, I'm Professor of Architecture and Global Modernities here at the Bartlett School of Architecture in London. 
Uh, my previous publications um, I've, I've put here just so there are on the recording if you want to return to it, but what I want to focus on today is Asmara. It was the first major project that I undertook um, with my colleague Guang Yu Ren, and we've been working on histories of modernism outside of the West ever since. The work owes the biggest debt uh, to this extraordinary group of individuals from Asmara, the Asmara Heritage Project, and um, the highest number of them were 20, 35 members of the team um, from 2014 um, to the present day, um, but particularly up to 2017 when the nomination for Asmara went to UNESCO and was successfully inscribed. So I framed the presentation today in four parts. The first, I just want to touch on the theory of multiple modernities, which um, I have used through my teaching and through my practice over the last 20 years. Then I'm afraid I have to give a very brief history lesson uh, with regards to Eritrea. It's a very complex, extremely complex history. And Dawit and I were talking about this last night and we felt that maybe it was helpful just to give a very potted history. So those of you that are less familiar will understand the context in which we're working. Then I'll give a summary of modernism and Asmara as, as it appears through architecture in particular. Um, that will be a fairly uh, sort of summary um, focus on, on the buildings and the built landscape, because I want to focus in particular at the end on the UNESCO World Heritage um, nomination. So to start with, the theory of multiple modernities, as I said, has been central to my work uh, since I started uh, researching in Eritrea in the early 2000s. Uh, my PhD was on modernism in China which has many similarities in terms of the historiography of modernism outside of the West. And in a journal published in 1998 titled Early Modernities, they noted that it's a fact that Asia, like Africa and Latin America, figures less in major scholarly tomes than do either Europe or North America. And this brings us very close to the debate on Orientalism. I don't know how familiar many of you are with regards to Edward Said's seminal text, Orientalism from the 1970s, he defines it as a Western style for dominating and having authority over the Orient. In this case, um, this could be um, through my work in China, it certainly could be applicable to Eritrea. The idea that the European identity is a superior one in comparison with all other non-European peoples and cultures. So that's the lens through which um, I generally explore the modernist context of Eritrea. And in support of, or being supported by the theory of multiple modernities, um, which suggests that Western patterns of modernity are not the only authentic modernities. And I would contend that Asmara is a, is a fine example of that. So if we take this in the context of, of the, the planet and the way that modernity or the historiography, certainly of architectural modernity is framed very much as a, um, having its origins in Europe and sort of disseminating or emanating from Europe, um, both through North America um, to the rest of the world. Um, this is essentially what I would challenge or contest. So I've said in, in previous publications, implicit in modernism, despite its international pretensions, is the assumption of inferiority of sites or forms of artistic expression beyond the West. This position is often described in terms of center periphery, which asserts the inauthenticity, belatedness, dilutedness and remoteness of the non-West, whether geographically intellectually or even racially. So when it comes to a site like Eritrea in the Horn of Africa, the idea that modernism there is remote from the centers of Europe, um, it is perhaps dilute because it's been mixed with, with the other, um, it's perhaps a little bit later than occurred. These are all things that add up to the, the idea that there's less sort of cultural value, which has profound implications when it comes to UNESCO World Heritage listing. In order to sort of contextualize that and to make sense of it in its own historical context, as I said, I would like to give just a very brief potted history of, of Eritrea. The built environment um, extends many, many centuries, if not millennia. Um, there is a extraordinary archeological site in the highlands, um, which is said to be the birthing, uh, bathing place of the Queen of Sheba in Kohaito. But I think most particularly and pertinently to Asmara's modernist heritage, this archaeological excavation um, started in the early 20th or late 19th century um, and was recently extensively excavated by a team of um, a combination of Italian and Eritrean archaeologists, which is said to be one of the first Christian churches in Africa, um, dating from the fourth century in sub-Saharan Africa. 
Jumping ahead uh, to the colonial period, which started in 1885 with the Berlin Conference and in for Eritrea in 1889, when the Italians um, occupied the plateau of Asmara. This is what Asmara looked like at that time. It's two and a half thousand meters altitude. And this is the encampment of the regional prince at that time, Ras Alula and his, his um, encampment. To get up to that plateau, the Italians had to invest enormously in infrastructure. And I think Dawita will be talking a little bit about this in his work. Um, railway um, construction, extraordinary um, steam railway that winds its way up from the Red Sea coast up to Asmara. Construction of roads and bridges, and perhaps most extraordinary, the world's longest cable car. By 1916, the plans for Asmara as a city um, were well established, and this is a map showing the racial segregation of the city. The pink areas are the Europeans quarter, the orange areas are the mixed zone, and the light orange here is the industrial zone. What is not marked on that map is the areas of, of the Eritrean population who were displaced from the original village of Asmara. This is a photograph of the city around about 1934, 35, which shows the Eritrean population displaced to the north um, in a very unregulated um, area of the city, which remains that way today. In 1935, under the, um, obviously under the fascist regime in Eritrea, the um, Italians um, invaded neighboring Ethiopia. This is Haile Selassie appealing to the League of Nations against that occupation. It was a fairly brief occupation um, ending in 1941 with the Allies defeating Italy in Eritrea and Ethiopia. In 1943, the Americans arrived and established a military base in Asmara, which um, lasted until the late 1970s. In 1952, so the British period was just a 10-year protectorate. In 1952, Eritrea was um, federated as part of Ethiopia. And in 1962, it became annexed as a state within Ethiopia. And the struggle for independence started around then. There was a 30 year struggle within which the regime of Haile Selassie was deposed by a communist regime supported by the Soviet Union, which for may many of you maybe, especially in the dairy context, would understand through the lens of live aid and the famine of, the, um, of Ethiopia, which at the time, of course, Eritrea was part of. Then in 1991, liberation. So I'm sorry for that. There's a lot of history to take in there, but it's important that we understand Eritrea, not just as a, as a post-colonial context within the context of Italy, but also having experienced British rule and, and two types of Ethiopian rule. So for me, starting work, um, I started my research in Eritrea in the early 2000s, um, and this is some of the way it was sort of documented by the international press as being celebrated as this frozen city or this secret city. And I'll just run through a few um, examples of the types of buildings that you would find when you go to Asmara. I hope many of you will get that chance in your lifetimes. I can guarantee it's an extraordinary experience. Modernism in, in Asmara and indeed in Eritrea is quite diverse. It was quite flamboyant, quite playful. Um, it didn't adhere to the sort of strict guidelines that occurred in some modernist cities. Um, we have cinemas such as Capital, which is the largest cinema, um, seating 1,600 people and even, even has a retractable roof. There's the Odeon Cinema. This is the um, archival drawing, and I'll come on to the archives later but the building itself is slightly smaller, slightly more modest than the, intent, the intended project. We have Cinema Impero. There are hotels and you'll start to see, you get a sense of the, the type of style of architecture. As I said, it is quite diverse and flamboyant, but it conforms to a certain language that is unquestionably rooted, I think, in Italian rationalism. This is a casino and brothel. This is a set of shops and apartments a garage, again, shops and offices, police headquarters at the time, another hotel, a bar, and a petrol station. A, this is the workshops for the Lancia car factory. 
This is a soap factory. So we can see it in all building typologies. It wasn't just um, confined to residential and even in details too, like this gatehouse to this industrial complex. And perhaps most famously, the Fiat Tagliero service station, a petrol station designed as an aeroplane with these extraordinary 30 meter cantilevered wings. In searching through the archives almost 20 years ago, we found the original documentation for that building. And to get it through the building regulations, we see that the, the engineers and architects had to present it with posts supporting those wings, but it survives to this day as an extraordinary cantilevered structure and perhaps the most iconic of Asmara's buildings. And then we, the other thing about the archival um, research that we were able to do in the municipality, which in the process of the UNESCO nomination, my, the team, um, the Asmara Heritage Project, scanned over 80,000 documents, and they contain extraordinary projects that were never realized. So we get a, a window into a world that the Italians had imagined, but never actually realized. Again, because of that short period of time in which they were able to complete these projects before 1941. This is an underground service complex. What we believe to be Africa's first multi-story car park. Asmara had a very big car problem in the 1930s with over 50,000 cars. We can see the types of lifestyles that were imagined, ballroom dancing on the roofs of this bar, and the types of shops and boutiques and the fashions that the people in, in downtown Asmara were expected to wear. The buildings that were um, meant to house the population of mostly poor migrants, um, Italian migrants coming to Eritrea, and the humble dwellings that some of them were expected to live in. We can see the way that the political propaganda was incorporated into the architecture itself with this Frasquet's axe being incorporated into the, the two um, doorway um, towers, either flanking this doorway. And in the fascist party regional headquarters and the way that's depicted in the project and the way it looks in this rather humble building. And finally, the Casa del Fascio on the Viale Mussolini, the main street through Asmara, um, with its fascist axe, uh, fascist eagle hanging beneath a proposed balcony here that was never completed under the Italian occupation. And it's now the Ministry of Education. Another facet of the archives was to try and to try and bring them to life a little bit, particularly in the way that we engage with the public during the UNESCO nomination. Um, so to try and get the public to understand this is their history and the role that their grandparents played in creating that history. So we took some of the archival photographs that were in the municipality and recreated them by going to exactly the same spot where that photographer stood and overlaying them with the present day. So people could understand the context they're very familiar with through this uh, juxtaposition of um, the past. And we get to see through the streets as well, rather interestingly, like this is the river that ran through Asmara and it was culverted in the 1930s. So we can see that process under the street and also the, the main sewage system um, and part of that river underneath the main, the main street, Harnett Avenue. And we did an extensive amount of public engagement um, in trying to um, engage the public in understanding that history, um, becoming part of that history, contributing to that history. This is an example of that process in the Asmara Festival, which happens every year, and over a million Eritreans in a population of four million have visited. And just to close this section, um, finally, before we get on to the final section of this talk, I want to highlight the St. Mary's Orthodox Cathedral as an example of the Eritreans' contribution um, to this modernist heritage in Asmara. You can see um, in the architecture um, of this building, which was designed in 1938, the traditional technique of monkey head construction, which was devised um, and, and quite common in, the, in this part of Africa, where layers of wood and stone before the advent of lime mortar um, were bound together by these protruding and perpendicular dowels, which, which in their protrusion from the wall looked like monkey heads. In the early iterations of the St. Mary's Orthodox Cathedral, we can see the three generations here, the original one, um, when the Italians arrived with those monkey heads, then a new church was built in the 1920s. And finally in 1938, um, this church um, was, was completed. But we can also see evidence of that layering of different types of stone, that understanding of the qualities of the stone and the stone masonry that go back to the fourth century in that archaeological excavation. So there is a link between these Byzantine um, uh, era 
construction techniques in the fourth century to modernism in the 20th century, which would not have been known to the architects um, the, under the Italian um, colonization. We can see it throughout Asmara, um, both explicitly in the cathedral, as well as in this, for example, this um, industrial store, um, in walls everywhere, as well as in conventional dwellings and walls that we see today. So that reliance on Eritrean labor um, and their construction skills and knowledge um, is underneath the skin of almost every modernist building in Asmara. So modernism in Asmara is unique in that respect and dependent on the skills of the local population, albeit not recognized at that time. So this brings me on to the final part, um, just very briefly, and the UNESCO World Heritage nomination that, that um, was um, part of the Asmara Heritage Project's work from 2014. It involves an enormous amount of work by that team of documenting the city and mapping the city, as I said, um, um, scanning 80,000 archival drawings. And when you nominate a, a site for World Heritage Listing, you have to do so under certain criteria. There are six available for cultural sites. Um, you only need to have one of those criteria. We went for three of them, and I just want to highlight number three, which is um, to bear a unique or at least exceptional testimony to a cultural tradition or to a civilization which is living or which has disappeared. Now this for me and for the team was essential because it spoke about that contribution of Eritreans and their labor and their skills and knowledge in constructing modernism in Asmara. It wasn't just a collection of European buildings in Africa. Um, however, UNESCO rejected that. And in the end, we were successful, but only with criteria two and four, which speaks largely about just the buildings themselves. So this highlights a problem in the way I believe UNESCO um, and other international and regional organizations understand modernism and the way they assess or ascribe value to it. Um, to be on the World Heritage List, you have to prove you have outstanding value to humanity, irrespective of the territory on which you're located or which the site is located. So it shouldn't matter where you are in the world if you can prove that outstanding universal value to humanity. But if that's the case, then it seems curious as to why Europe has five times the number of cultural sites in Africa. It says something about the way we value European heritage compared to African cultural heritage. If we map that, we can see that the entire continent of Africa with 54 countries has fewer sites than just two countries in Europe, Italy and Spain. Or if we look at it from a different perspective, Sub-Saharan Africa, Italy alone um, has almost comparable number of sites to the entire Sub-Saharan region. And just recently, I've been involved in um, another World Heritage nomination for a modernist site in Eastern Europe. Um, and in part of in doing that, we have to do a comparative analysis. And I came across this, this commentary on the contributions of Le Corbusier, which are unquestionable, of course, in the history of the modern movement. But the way that this contribution has been framed, I think speaks to the problem that exists in the way that we understand modernism. So they say, despite the constraints imposed on Le Corbusier by limited budget and primitive technology, the use of that term is questionable, and an in inhospitable climate, Le Corbusier succeeded in achieving exceptional sculptural architectural expression. So no credit is given to the workers in India who created his, his designs. It, um, sole credit is given to the author. Um, and the buildings combine in a single expression, European modernity and the multiple variations of the expression of reinforced concrete with local techniques and constraints. So local techniques there are acknowledged, but they're also framed as constraints rather than as having value in their own right. So I just leave with this final or penultimate slide um, and quoting Jyoti Hosagraha, who I've um, been a great admirer of her work um, over the last 20 years. She's now Deputy Director of UNESCO and affecting really good change in the organization. And in her book, Indigenous Modernity, she said the project here is not merely to celebrate and give voice to minority discourses and knowledges in order to include them in their subordinate positions into existing privileged accounts of modernity, but to question the master narrative. And that for me is the most important thing to do um, for us to do now is not to see Eritrea or Derry or Ireland or, or other um, territories which have been framed as peripheral, but to change the master narrative within which those um, sites um, operate and to give them equal value on their own terms. 
in trying to do this, um, we've established a, an initiative last year, which in um, two weeks now, or two or three weeks from now, will have its first conference. It's called Modern Heritage of Africa and Modern Heritage in the Anthropocene. And it's seeking to do ex exactly what Jyoti Hasagraha highlights here, is to change the master narrative around modernism, to understand this global phenomenon that occurred in the 20th century as a planetary experience, not one of Europe or emanating from Europe or the West with all the values that are that are part of that, but seeing it as a planetary experience involving all of humanity. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was extremely enriching. And again, to uh, mention if anybody has any questions as we go along, put them in the chat to questions for Laura. And now over to our next speaker. I'm very pleased to introduce Dawit L. Petros. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, thank you for the invitation to, to participate in the, uh, um, in the event today. Edward, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I'm going to start sharing my screen, turn off my, my own image so that we can look at the work. And uh, I should have this down to just under 20 minutes. At a certain point midway, I will have to exit the PowerPoint in order to show a few minutes of a video that is really important to the discussion that we're having. So, so what I'd like to do briefly is contextualize, um, sort of contextualize the research of my project with, uh, with some of the uh, historical material, the discussion and the questions that it, that is produced for me, and then move to a couple of key works from this current project called Spacio Disponibile. I begin necessarily with just a very quick sort of cursory uh, biography that intersects nicely with the historical overview that, uh, that Edward has provided. Um, so I was of the generation that left in the first war of liberation between Eritrea and Ethiopia, 61 to 91. And it's important because it is necessary to assess the different mechanisms which make that, that uh, sort of movement out of Eritrea sort of different from the one that I'm looking at uh, in, my current, in my current research. <clears throat> so I work largely through photography, installation, research, moving image work, and I'm interested in uh, deciphering the trajectories of my own mobility, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Kenya, Sudan, the UK, into Canada, and thinking about how I can, the, you know, reconfigure the material, the information that bears on these, you know, on these, on these experiences so that I can better understand and point towards different understandings of social or cultural histories that, uh, that inform these, these lived experiences. So this means that this current work and my larger work is really preoccupied with questions of history, historiography, place, and, and movement. I begin here with uh, with a slide of, uh, of a book from eighteen uh, from eighteen ninety five by Fisaha Gergis, and it is a um, it's a publication that I sought um, that I was trying to find at the tail end of a thirteen month travel from you know from West Africa, North Africa, Europe into Southern Europe in 2014, 2015. and I spent nine months in various Italian archives, sort of trying to find material existence for the, you know, for the historical sort of existence of this figure between 1890 and 1895 in Italy, and I was unable to. And so this absence, sort of this gap of information and material sort of opened up a set of questions that has oriented my research and my work. And some of these are, you know, what are the dynamics that are at work between mobilities that move and shift over the course of time and imperial formations of a country like Italy that again have shifted over time. Um, what is visible in uh, in these spaces when one brings dialogues of uh, when, when one brings dialogues of, of, of um, various sort of cultural frameworks and cultural spaces that share uh, that share dynamics of inequality into conversation with one another? 
So as I said, this I spent nine months trying to find material evidence of Fasaha Gergis, and I was unable to. Um, the text that you see here is called about the author's journey from Ethiopia to Italy and about the impressions made on him by his stay in that country in Tigrinya. So this is a this is a, six, a short 16 page publication written in 18, 1895. The importance of it for me was the way in which it positions contemporary relationships between Eritrea, Italy, Eritrea and, and, uh, and Europe within a different framework, within a different framework. Another image that I would like to show you that, uh, that sort of that um, articulates my interest primarily in the manner in which mobility and migration out of Eritrea into the so-called European migration crisis are articulated are these two images. So the image on the left is the arrest of a young Eritrean uh, refugee called uh, Medhane Tesmarian Barhe, who was falsely accused of being a notorious human rights smuggler. And the image on the right depicts a genre that is quite prevalent from the inception of Italy's colonial project, which is the arrest of indigenous subjects. And I'm interested in the way in which the image on the left and on the right, the image on the left sort of highlights this overemphasis with which Italy and the absence of the Italian colonial sort of consciousness approaches a place like Eritrea, as though there isn't this intimate familiarity that has been developed in the period of time, some of which Edward alluded to uh, earlier. And so these layers of historical and cultural intimacy in which Italy's relationship with Eritrea, with Ethiopia, Somalia, the history of Italian colonialism and, Orient and Orientalism, the manner in which these things are denied is central to the, uh, to the questions that, I, uh, that I'm posing. And so I spent a great deal of time and continue to spend a great deal of time in various archives, sort of trying to unearth and sort of look at historical material that can help me articulate what these, uh, what these uh, points of connection are. And Spazio Disponible really looks at uh, research that focuses on three elements, architecture, infrastructure and publications of, col of Italian col colonization and really asks how these forms are metonyms that evidence and point to the sites in which Eritrea's formation and the Italian colonial, uh, uh, colonial project converge. So colonial era publications, photographs like uh, photographs. And in looking at this historical material, the question that I grapple with is how do these physical objects that are produced in the past, how are they deployable in ways that I can approach them not as sites of pure knowledge retrieval that are unproblematic sources of information, but pointing towards them and the gaps in which they can, they can enable um, another inquiry about how evidence or records of evidence can operate in the, in the present. An architecture. So this is Casa d'Italia, uh, a community center built by the Italians in 1936 uh, in Montreal, Canada. And so the approach in all of the approach in looking at this historical material is to think about the relationship of colonialism and modernity within the context of Eritrea and Italy, not as ancient history, but as living history, whose impact shapes and informs the present uh, the present moment, rather than approaching it as a as, as a um, as a concluded as a concluded period. So in 2017, I began research into this, into this building here, as I said, an Italian community center with a very complex history um, and bringing this question of this particular building into, into the research allowed me to sort of think about how can the problem of, how can the question of Italian migration to Canada, to North America be brought into what I think of as this triangulation of the question of Italian colonialism, Eritrean migration and histories of Italian migration and how do forms such as this 
become part of a story or part of a narrative that are again are at the or at the absence or at the or at the edge of how uh, Italian migration or Italian colonialism are kept as often sort of distinct histories. So how do we how do I establish a more nuanced reading of the affinities within which certain materials are produced and um, and the image worlds that I'm attempting to create in, uh, in 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 the present moment and back to that question of biography I was raised within a very particular uh, cultural familial context in which my understanding of the stories with which Italian colonialism established itself and whose legacies continue to play out in particular manners in Eritrea, there was this enormous gap between these. And so a lot of this work has been about my own understanding, better understanding of how the entanglements of colonialism in the Horn of Africa and the, entangle and the current complexities that are unfolding now intersect. And the other thing is really sort of thinking about this absence within the, 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 the absence in the, in the space of Italian narration of colonialism. My interest is sort of exact, how can I participate in a discussion of this absence? So it's how can I actively reconfigure these historical materials that I'm working with on the one hand, in ways that point to their original content and open them up to certain types of movement or recoding, which is another way of asking is how can I use the power of these original documents while always calling into question the, uh, their, their authority. And so Spazio Disponible is really rooted in an attempt to balance an analysis of cultural texts their materiality, and to understand both how they exerted influence in the past and how not looking at them in the contemporary exerts power and social force. So spazio disponibile, this idea of available space, sort of embedded within this notion, in, embedded within this title, is this indication not just of Eritrea, but Africa itself as an empty space that is waiting to be exploited and to be, and to be modernized and to be filled with a notion of, 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 of modernity and progress. But this, this available space, this gap also became a, a device with which I could consider how does one occupy, what does one do with a space not in an attempt to fill it with correct or accurate accounts of history, but how does one occupy a space in order to raise questions and provocations that point to how history has been constructed and inhabited um, both in the present and in the past. So I show you, I'm only going to show you one single installation image so that you have a sense of how the works come together, the different languages, sculpture, moving image, um, screen prints and photographs. Bear with me, this is where I now just very quickly need to switch over to my video. So I will play this for, for a couple of minutes and just a quick introduction, so this is the piece that was done in the Casa d'Italia, the, um, the community center in Montreal that I described earlier. And so it's a two channel film installation in which a camera, restless steady cam, sort of moves through, um, through the Casa d'Italia from the exterior to the interior, uh, the archive room, hallways, auditorium. And there's a voice over narration in Italian that unfolds alongside the image that really questions how the Casa d'Italia in Montreal as a built form is connected to built form in Eritrea. So let me just play a couple of minutes of this for you.
quando sono andati in Italia c'è un altro fattore che si sono totalmente dimenticati dell'Eritrea totalmente avevo la nostalgia pensavo all'Eritrea ma eh, avevano ormai eh, avevano perso le speranze per me. e avevano totalmente abbandonato l'idea dell'Eritrea totalmente Osservando questa costruzione, eh, mi ricordo che nell'epoca fascista, anzi nel, nei pensieri di Mussolini, eh, il tondo, il curvo, era molto importante, perché il fascio, i fasci, erano tondi. E a Mussolini piaceva l'architettura monumentale grandi finestre, grandi porte, larghe porte, anche le... e il tondo con, con eh, una, una, una stele oppure una torre, la torre era molto importante per Mussolini, perché nella torre c'erano i balconi dove lui poteva fare i suoi discorsi. So what you have in the work is um, Geometra, who's analyzed Geometra Petros, who's a surveyor in Asmara, in, in, uh, in Asmara, who's analyzing the syntax of the building and comparing it to similar architectural structures in Eritrea. And the work gets to the intersection of, of migration to North America, to Canada, migration stories within narrations, narratives of mobility uh, in Italian colonialism in Eritrea, which is, uh, which is something that is frequently sort of considered. And so the aesthetics of the building and the way in which architectures, architecture serves as a microcosm with which sort of fissures, dreams and aspirations take shape are what, are what Geometra problem, problematizes. And so this sense of what do you do, what does one do with this historical material? As I alluded to earlier, through the questions and the provocations that I uh, sort of pointed to, these sorts of gestures, appropriating the cover of uh, the covers of publications and playing with the language so that la questione africana, sort of the, the, the question of, of where Italian Eritrean colonialism can, can function within the context of Italy in 1888, 1890, is inverted to include la questione italiana so that the notion of a one-way trafficking of this kind of a question is, is held in suspension. And so this kind of, this is the type of gesture that I'm interested in, sort of a rethinking of archival material that positions these objects not as singular repositories of unvarnished information, but as materials with a plasticity that can be pushed, that can be repositioned and respatialized. A constant retelling of the future and the past. Images that were his originally sort of produced to bear witness to the radical transformation of the Eritrean landscape and the environment, building of infrastructure, industry, views of labor, uh, in which we see Eritreans and Italians working together. These images were intended to do a particular type of work, right? Evidence, unproblematic evidence of the benefits of, of progress and modernity that Italian colonialism benevolently was bestowing on Eritrea. And so this kind of, you know, these kinds of images point to, uh, point to slippages, taking, inserting blank spaces, dark spaces, reconfiguring uh, um, photographs, applying elements of images from one point of the, um, you know, of the, of the strip to another. And so finding ways in which I can extract and re-extract information and situating it sort of elsewhere, um, inserting these black bands which point towards um, 
which point towards those types of excesses that enter an image that allow a certain type of recuperative work within the, within these within these uh, within this kind of material. So it's looking at the images, all of these are images produced within the context of the Italian archive. And so I'm interested in how I can point towards the edge of these photographic frames and um, sort of harness information that has been strategically left out. In 36, 1936, the world's longest cable car was built in Eritrea to connect the sea to uh, Masawa to, uh, to, to the capital city. And it was an astounding technological feat. The, the, the Telefarica ran 71.8 kilometers from Masawa to, to, uh, to, to Asmara, transporting all manner, of, you know, all manner of objects, goods, foods, and supplies. And all that remains of this, uh, this remarkable technological structure is, you know, are some empty pylons. And so what I've done with this work is really sort of think, you know, sort of think about how can I point towards uh, a balance between a certain type of visibility and invisibility so that the presence, the continued sort of presence of this object is not, uh, is not sort of rooted in its physical, in its physical occupation of the, uh, of, of the landscape, but instead of its ideological operation so that I can sort of point towards what aspects of development progress differ in terms of how Eritreans are constituting and reconstituting our own narratives of, my, of, of, uh, of, mod of modernity and technology. And so what you see in this image is, in, in this work, are landscapes that move from, the, uh, from, the, from Masawa all the way to Asmara. And then on the back of this black plexiglass are um, inscribed into it with, you know, with CNC router, are, you know, is the ghostly trace of the, you know, of the, of, of the Telefetica. And so I'm really interested in finding a way in which questions of what are the absences, what are the specters that continue to operate within the relationship of Eritrean's, uh, Eritrea's sort of complex engagement with Italy and Italy's um, willful, willful um, sort of turning away from that history and what are the implications for those who are moving from the Horn of Africa into Europe through Italy, and how does the specificity of this history sort of require the narration of how and who is moving into, into Europe and into Italy to, to be considered differently? And with that, I will pause here. And thank you so much, Dawit. Uh, I think living history, shaping and informing the present and reconfiguring in absence of thoughts that I'm definitely going to be uh, mulling over now. Uh, so we're going to have our screen break uh, uh, just for sort of six minutes. So grab a cup of something and we'll reconvene at two o'clock with Dr. Catherine Milligan for our discussion. Uh, note, whilst the presentations have been recorded, uh, the discussions won't be. So tune in and uh, get involved. Turn those cameras on and feel free to join the conversation. Uh, quick plug, you can watch our previous seminar presentations on our YouTube channel and I'll put the link in the chat. And finally, thank you again so, so much to our speakers, Edward and Dewitt, and also to the CCA team behind the scenes, Laura McCafferty, Mel Bradley, Fiona Allen, uh, to all of our supporters and to all of you for joining us. Okay, thank you. See you in five.